guys, how are you all doing? If you're new here, well... Sorry about that. Anyway, if you're new here, welcome. My name is Crazy Ken, and today we're gonna be talking about Quibi. You've probably heard of it before, but you have no idea what it is. That's okay, I don't either. So I wanted to look into it more, and thanks to my buddy Sage, he helped me research this, I actually learned a lot, and I'd like to share that with you today. In the end, this venture ended up getting over $1.75 billion invested into it. The actual number probably is higher than that. But it collapsed in only eight months with all this power and money behind it. How did it die in less than a year? And also, back to the basics, what is Quibi? Those are all valid questions. So I'm gonna help answer all of those and more right now. Quibi was a mobile-only streaming service. The name is a portmanteau for Quick Bytes. The service was operated by Quibi Holdings, a privately held company founded in August 2018 under the name New TV by Meg Whitman and Jeffrey Katzenberg. Meg Whitman was a CEO at eBay, overseeing massive expansions including the PayPal acquisition in 2002 and Skype in 2005. Yeah, eBay owned Skype for a while. I had no idea either. In 2008, she became CEO of Hewlett Packard and she resigned in 2017. Katzenberg, on the other hand, is a story for a whole different day, but in short, he's a big wig in the film and media worlds. He had leadership roles at Paramount Pictures, the Walt Disney Company, and he co-founded DreamWorks along with Steven Spielberg and David Geffen. So he's a big deal. Anyway, back to new TV. It was time to raise the moolah. Disney, NBC Universal, Sony Pictures, Viacom CBS, Warner Media, and tons of other big names invested in New TV. And at this time, New TV raised about a billion dollars in funding. How did they raise so much? Because Katzenberg, the dude had one hell of a resume. Could you imagine that guy applying somewhere? <laughs> I think you're a little overqualified to work at Pizza Hut. So the money was coming in, and in October 2018, the venture was renamed to Quibi. And in June 2019, the official launch date was revealed, April 6th, 2020. At CES 2020, Quibi was demoed to a bunch of people. I mean, that's a really big trade show, so good place to get more funding. At the end of their second wave, I think they got around, give or take, 750 million more dollars. So add that on top of the billion, we're looking at about $1.75 billion dollars invested into Quibi. So that's the brief history. Now, the jarring question. Well, one of the jarring questions. What the hell is Quibi? <laughs> I remember seeing tons of ads for this on Twitter. I guess the awareness was good, but I still didn't understand it. Here's the thing. You know, I'm not a marketing guru by any stretch of the imagination, but I do know that if you confuse, you lose. And maybe that was the big reason why Quibi ended up losing. But anyway, that aside, let's dive in to what this thing actually is. Quibi is a short form mobile only streaming service with two pricing tiers, $4.99 a month with ads and $7.99 a month without ads. So everybody and their hamster has a streaming service. How the heck was this different? It was different because it focused on short form content in a Vine or a TikTok-esque presentation, but with way higher production value and generally no video would be longer than 10 minutes. In some cases, a feature length film would be chopped up into multiple chapters, for example. For video playback, Quibi used their own little technology called Turnstile, and this was kind of the big thing that differentiated it from other platforms. So you could watch the video vertically, but you can also rotate horizontally into landscape and the video would adapt. Sometimes different camera angles would show up, the text would reformat. Sometimes certain things would have a completely different experience. There was one show where you watch it normally in landscape, but when you turn it into portrait, you actually see what's on the main character's phone screen. So there's some interesting things you could do with this concept. Now on a technical level, being a video guy, I think it's kind of cool, the turnstile technology. But in the end, is it something we really need? Do we really need a multi-aspect ratio, high production value, mobile only streaming service? So that's a perfect segue to what I want to discuss next. How did something with so many big names and studios behind it and with so much money fail and shut down in only eight months? First off, shows. Loads of money were dumped into the shows with big stars in them. Now to avoid any copyright issues, I'm gonna keep this part short and just simplify it. The shows didn't give users enough of a reason to open the app. 
And that's tough. Even if the shows were good, they're still new, and it takes time to get that momentum built. To make things worse, there was no backlog of already really proven and loved content. But one big reason you couldn't make that work well anyway is if you had a backlog of content, none of it would work with the turnstile technology. Next, the lawsuit. Interactive multimedia company Echo sued Quibi over the turnstile technology, claiming infringement on intellectual property. To Quibi's luck, the preliminary injunction motion was actually denied, but the suit continues. According to an October 29th article on Variety.com, Echo is seeking a $96.5 million payout for damages. This isn't over yet, but I'll keep an eye on it. The next issue was the lack of sharing. So many things I end up discovering are actually through friend recommendations or through social media posts. And I'm just gonna say it, memes. If stuff is buzzing on Twitter and there's memes and jokes, that's organic advertising. And I have discovered many cool shows and other products through people just sharing it organically on social media. But with Quibi, you couldn't screenshot anything. So you couldn't share things easily with pictures and visuals or video recording. Now later, they actually built in a screenshot function, but I don't know how much of an issue this truly was. Yeah, it probably hurt a bit, but like every big app that streams video blocks screenshots, at least on iOS, iPadOS, and macOS. You can't take screenshots of Netflix or Hulu on any of those operating systems. So I'm not sure how big of a deal this was. I feel like it was blown out of proportion a bit, but yeah, it was maybe some missed opportunity. Oh well. Another issue was limited platforms. It was mobile only, but why? If it's mobile only, you miss out on all the people that just wanna kick back and relax and watch on their TV or watch on their laptop. Like, you miss out on all of that. Now later, they did integrate Apple's AirPlay technology and Google's Chromecast technology. So you could stream the videos to your TV, but then you would miss out on the turnstile technology, which was the key unique feature that Quibi offered. So overall, it's just bad by design. This next issue is debatable, but I'm gonna mention it anyway. The bad launch timing. Quibi launched on April 6th, 2020, but at that time, Pandemic Incorporated was gearing up to launch version 19 of their infamous COVID product. Okay, jokes aside, yes, it did launch during a pandemic, so there's gonna be less people standing in line, there's gonna be less people on buses and trains and in public transport. That maybe hurt Quibi a bit. It maybe would have lasted a few more months, but it still would have perished. The biggest issue was they just didn't know what people needed. The people running this didn't know the habits of people on their phones. They didn't know what people wanted. It's hard to do, not gonna lie. I've worked with marketing people a bunch. Marketing is hard, but it is what will make or break a product. Good marketing will carry a crummy product. But at the same time, bad marketing will kill a good product. And on top of that, they were entering already a very competitive streaming market. It's very saturated. So Quibi was in a tough spot. What happened next? In September, reports showed Quibi was looking for a buyer. They even approached Apple's SVP of internet services, Eddie Q, but he wasn't interested. And a few weeks later, Quibi announced apps for Apple TV, Fire TV, and Google TV, which solves one of the problems we mentioned earlier. But then literally one day later, Quibi published an open letter announcing the shutdown. The service would remain open until December 1st. Everyone was about to be laid off from the company. And it was reported that Katzenberg asked everyone to listen to Get Up Again from Trolls to help lift their spirits. I don't know what their severance pay was, but I, I just hope they got something a little more than a little music clip. I hope. Then the fateful day came, December 1st. Quibi's Twitter page is locked down, the Facebook posts vanished, the Instagram posts are gone, the app ceased to work. However, their main website and YouTube channel are still up. As for the shows, I don't know where they're gonna go. I'm sure we'll see them pop up somewhere. In fact, public figures already got picked up by HBO Max, so that's one. In the end, Quibi died with about 500,000 subscribers, probably a little more than that. And they actually had a lot of five-star ratings in the App Store, so maybe the app itself wasn't that bad. 500,000 subscribers is more than I have on my YouTube channel right now anyway, so hey, that sounds great. But in the grand scheme of things, that number is dwarfed by how much money was invested into this company. Even if every subscriber paid $8 a month, that's only $48 million gross annually, which is nothing compared to the near $1.75 billion of investment. So even though this idea didn't work out, I won't be surprised if we see something like it in five to 10 years and people are gonna go like, oh my gosh, Quibi did that. They were trying to do that. Like, 
it's gonna happen. Give it some time. I always think about the Zune and the Zune Pass. The concept for part of it was pretty cool. You pay a monthly charge to subscribe to music. It didn't work out back then. But nowadays, tens of millions of people subscribe monthly to music services. So not everything works out. Any entrepreneur will tell you that in order to succeed, you have to fail a bunch. Even if you have the money and the reputation of someone like Katzenberg, you're still bound to make a mistake or just be too ambitious and it doesn't work out. I applaud the team for trying something at least. So thanks again to my buddy Sage for helping me research this episode. If you'd like to check out his tech and gaming channel, you can do so here. And if you've used Quibi before, even if you haven't used Quibi before, I just wanna know your thoughts. Feel free to write them in the comments below. And if you wanna help fund the future of the Computer Clan, plus get some awesome perks along the way, feel free to pledge to my Patreon. Thanks in advance for your support. I asked Katzenberg for some funding, but uh, he said no. It was only $1.75 billion. I mean, pocket change. And hey, if you like this episode, you know what to do. Thanks for sticking with me. Catch the crazy and pass it on. <laughs>